Uh, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker uh, for the evening, uh, Professor Anne Ager, who's Professor of Cellular Immunity and Immunotherapy at Cardiff University. And Anne studied at uh, King's College London initially and then moved to Cambridge and joined Darwin College, which is where I first met her, possibly in the disco, I think. Um, uh, and after training in microvascular biology, uh, well, she went to Boston and began her lifelong interests in high endothelial venule blood vessels and T cell trafficking. Uh, then moved to Manchester and then moved to the MRC National Institute for Medical Research, which was at the time at Mill Hill, and then moved to Cardiff um, and was awarded a personal chair in 2018. Uh, and since moving to Cardiff, Anne's research has focused on T-cell trafficking in virus infection and cancer, and more recently in Alzheimer's. Um, and that Anne has a dazzling um, list of achievements, which you can, too long to read out here, but uh, you can read about on the website. So, Anne. Thank you. I'll just put my water. Uh, thank you very much, John. I, was it the disco? I don't remember. <laughs> But um, it was the start of a lifelong friendship and it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you uh, this evening. So thank you for the invitation. So um, what I thought I'd do this evening is um, uh, talk about the, our immune systems and uh, how they defend, basically our immune system has evolved to defend our body, as you know, against infection. And um, we've learned a lot or, or with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic over the last couple of years and terms such as antibodies and antigens are, are floating around. So the first little bit of the talk, it'd be a little bit of revision for you <laughs> to see if you paid attention for the, the past two years. But really what I want to focus on is the um, realization, uh, I guess in the last sort of five to 10 years, that we can actually exploit our own immune systems to uh, attack and kill cancers. And this really is what I want to, to speak about this evening. So um, I'm in Wales, and uh, this is the Welsh flag, if uh, any of you uh, recognise it. And there are statues of an iron Bevan um, all over uh, South Wales, obviously the founder of, um, of our, our uh, beloved NHS. And this is a very lively Bay Area in Cardiff. It used to be a, a well, Victorian uh, a city, a, a coal, a coal docks there, but of course it's no longer coal. So there's lots of um, uh, Millennium Center and um, lots of culture going on there. So it's quite a, a lively city, but I haven't been there much over the last couple of years. So um, just to summarize my talks, to let you know what's coming, as I, as I said, I'm gonna start off by summarizing um, the immune system and, and how it works and then really put into context. And it is the basic academic scientific breakthroughs that have put cancer immunotherapy on the map. And then uh, the challenges in getting cancer immunotherapists to work in patients. And I'm gonna talk about our uh, interest in how um, the cells of the immune system, how they home to have to home to cancers in order to kill cancer cells. And then I've put um, my experience, but I mean my laboratory, my, my research team's experiences in translating basic research from bench to bedside. And as this is the, the um, uh, Society for Applied Research, I thought it would be quite helpful to give some insights into that. And, and maybe uh, people in the audience can, uh, can advise me. Uh, so in the next slide, so the immune system, just, just to get us all on the same page, the immune system we understand has evolved to defend the body against infection. And of course, infections, I'm talking about viruses, bacteria, um, fungi can, can access the body via all ex, you know, possible external routes. So obviously we know about breathing in viruses. Um, I think this is quite intermittent, this actually. Sorry, breathing in um, uh, uh, influenza or uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, infecting the lungs. We know about um, bacterially infected foods that we can eat causing um, us uh, upset. We know that um, the skin is a natural barrier to infection, but obviously um, 
uh, parasites can can uh, break down the the skin barrier like mosquitoes and and pass transmit mal malaria or just physical damage and as soon as you damage your skin you're actually then um, your immune system or your body's exposed to everything that's floating around us um, and obviously then sexual uh, or transmission via the uh, genital urinary tract so that's um, uh, another source that we have to think about. Um, and the immune system, as again, you all know, is it, you know it's in your bloodstream because you give blood samples to your, to your GP to, to measure your um, uh, numbers of uh, uh, white cells or leukocytes, white blood cells, which are the major cells of the immune system here. So the blood's basically coming out of your arm. If you spin it in a, a low speed centrifuge, then you know you've got a majority or half the blood component is cells and the rest is plasma this um, uh, yellow fluid, so cell-free fluid. So in the cellular components, then um, actually most of the cells are your red blood cells, which are carrying uh, obviously oxygen around your body, um, and your white blood cells, which are the immune system, only make up about 1% of the, the total um, uh, blood volume. But they are mixtures of cells. There are T cells, B cells, and uh, neutrophils. I'm not going to go into detail about those. These are all very, very important in fighting off infections. And then there are uh, cells called platelets which are important for glotting and I hope um, you will have heard of T cells and B cells over the last two years so T cells um, will actually kill virus infected tissue and I will tell you that they'll also kill directly cancerous cells in our body if they're recognized as being uh, changed from our normal um, cells of our body. And B cells are the cells that make antibodies and it's antibodies that's, that circulate in the plasma. And of course, the goal of these vac vaccines, we've, we've, most of us I'm sure we've been injected with, is to generate antibodies that will coat SARS-CoV-2 and prevent it infecting our tissues. Um, so inflammation, what I want to say, that's what's going on in the bloodstream, but it's important um, in uh, any, any sort of infection or damage, then we get a normal inflammatory response. And what this involves is um, allowing those immune cells to move into our tissues. So our lungs, our heart, our, our liver, our, our muscles, or wherever the damage uh, or infection is in our bodies. So, and the blood vessels are very important in doing that because normally the immune cells circulate in the blood vessels here. Um, and as soon as you have any damage or infection, what happens, these blood vessels become leaky in a very controlled way. And so immune cells and plant Asthma can escape from the blood vessels and actually then clear, for example, this bacterial infection. So this movement of immune cells from the bloodstream into tissues is very, very important in our defense mechanism against infection. This is normal. Um, so I'm afraid I tried to set this video up, but it, it doesn't quite work. But I just want to show this is, if I could show it, it's inflammation in action. If anyone wants to see it, I can, I can um, show it to them afterwards. So essentially what we're looking in, in here is inside actually um, uh, a, um, an anesthetized mouse. And you can see, I'm sure, um, these are the blood vessels full of red cells. They are red. Um, and I. I can make out um, white cells, the leukocytes, which are actually sludging up against the wall of this damaged vessel and some of the white cells have moved into the tissues here. And that's what you want to happen in inflammation. And there are different, I'm not gonna go into details here, there are uh, different families of proteins that cooperate during this process of leukocyte homing, i.e. moving cells from the bloodstream into tissues where they can then do their job, be it clearing, um, uh, uh, infections. So where does cancer fit into all this? Well, as you know, the cancer is um, a, a disease of the genome. So alterations in our um, genetic code, mutations in our genes that, that cause cancer that really uh, generates or result in uncontrolled growth of, of cells. These changes in our genes can be detected by T cells these immune cells in our bodies. And um, uh, our T cells can be very, very good at killing cancer cells. So if we just look, if we look in this cartoon here, then you can see um, 
I think you can just about see a double helix here. When you've got somatic mutations and changes in the genetic code, this can result in single changes and uh, amino acid changes in proteins. And those proteins can get presented or exposed on the surface of a cell. And this is what a T cell will recognize and respond to. And um, actually this is uh, a picture I think that John found um, where we've got T cells actually attacking and, and trying to kill a, a cancer cell here. So the reason T cells can, can kill, kill cancer cells is killer T cells and T cells in general have X-ray vision. Okay, so and what I mean by that is that all of the uh, proteins in our, our, our bodies are made by our cells. And um, so proteins are um, basically um, uh, uh, formed after DNA is transcribed and translated into proteins, and then um, uh, amino acid, uh, the peptides from proteins are um, become associated with what's called our transplantation antigens and get exposed on the surface of, of the cells, all the nucleated cells in our body, all the cells that can, can make proteins. And this is what T cells can see. So I, what I've labeled here is, is a CTL, which is a, a killer T cell, a cytotoxic T cell. So as I said, they have X-ray vision because they can see inside our cells. So T cells recognize peptides, bits of proteins that are bound to what's called our, our MHC complexes, which is our transplantation antigens. This is what make us all unique from each other. So, so I can't accept um, John's T cells or anyone's T cells in body because my immune system will see those T cells as foreign. Um, and, and that's what the, the T cells will be seeing. Um, peptides are derived from cellular proteins that are degraded in, uh, inside the cell by the proteasome and then transported and um, uh, combined with these transplantation antigens, uh, MHC molecules and presented on the surface. And that's what killer T cells see. I think you can just see here. This is a T cell which has a, a specific T cell receptor which only reacts to this peptide bound in the context of this MHC molecule. And we have many different T cells with many different receptors. So basically we are born equipped to recognize many different um, uh, peptides which um, uh, we are not tolerant to. So they're recognized as being foreign. So we know that the uh, immune system actually does um, uh, uh, attack cancers or can control cancers. There have been natural experiments, but simply looking at a cancer that um, most for most solid cancers, the first thing, if it's bulky, is that the cancer is resected. If one looks at the, that resected tissue and you can um, basically freeze the tissue and then cut very thin sections and then use uh, uh, what's called immunostaining to stain for infiltrating T cells, then these brown slot, um, uh, spots here, they're all T cells infiltrating this um, section uh, from colorectal cancer. And we also know that um, by looking at the the number of T cells, where they are in the, in the resected cancer, and the type of T cell. I'm not going to go into the details. There are different types of T cell. But knowing um, that information here, um, you can actually show that uh, patient survival or patient outcomes, cancer patient outcomes, correlates very much with the number and the density and the type of T cell that's infiltrating the cancer. So this is uh, tumor infil infiltrating lymphocytes tills. You can see that in this um, uh, uh, cohort of patients, they have very high T cell, uh, T cell infiltrates, and those pa patients survive much better than, than patients in which their T cells are, are not infiltrated, uh, their cancers are not infiltrated by, by T cells. So this, um, obviously, it's retrospective analysis, you're looking at uh, tissues, what cancerous tissue, so the cancer is already developed, but this actually um, uh, allows uh, clinicians to be able to, to predict and to select uh, appropriate therapies for patients, depending on their type of uh, uh, immune response going on in their cancers. So um, a little bit of uh, uh, 
uh, so looking back in time now, the, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing in science. So the journal Science, the leading journal Science, cited cancer immunotherapy as the, the breakthrough of 2013. And, and you know, why, why did they do that? Um, well, the first thing I've shown you already that cancers have can have infiltrating immune cells, yet we have cancers developed. So clearly the immune system is failing in, all, in, in, in attacking and, and killing cancer cells. And we know now that's because cancers have many, many different strategies of hiding from the immune system. I'm just going to leave it at that. There are many different um, uh, ways of this and really stop. T cells either getting in there so they don't home properly, or if they do get in, they don't work. They basically don't kill cancer cells. So these are uh, ev evasion strategies. So what the breakthrough um, was in cancer immunotherapy in uh, uh, 2000, about 2014, 2015, was the discovery of so-called checkpoint blockade inhibitors. So these are um, pathways that became it, what was realized is that these are pathways that cancer cells stimulate in a, a, in a T cell to stop it from working. So it's putting the brakes on the T cells. So the breakthrough was actually uh, working out, uh, developing drugs that could um, release the brakes on, on T cells and allow them to, to operate inside uh, cancers and, and kill cancer cells. And this James Allison and uh, Tosuko Honjo were the two um, uh, scientists who actually discovered these checkpoint blockade inhibitors. And, and this has really revolutionized the way we think about cancer therapy now. And cancer immunotherapy has almost become, um, an, uh, 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 in some cancers now, a first line um, uh, therapy. Um, uh, you know, instead of um, surgery and radiotherapy for some cancers that are detected early and are, under, are infiltrated by the immune system, people are, are, are using these checkpoint blockade inhibitors. So these um, uh, two scientists quite rightly were joint recipients of the Nobel Prize for Medicine in, in 2018. Um, but the success of these checkpoint blockade inhibitors, which, as I say, what they do is take the breaks off the T cells that are already in the cancers, allowing them to kill cancer cells, doesn't work with all uh, patients. And it absolutely depends on having a good infiltrate of T lymphocytes in, in the cancer here. So if your, T cell, if your cancers are not infiltrated with T cells, then these checkpoint blockade inhibitors don't work very well at all. And so we're looking now for uh, additional uh, therapies. And this is uh, just a summary of that, that checkpoint blockade inhibitors don't work in all cancer patients. So this is a particular type of, of a colorectal cancer um, called Lynch syndrome, where the uh, patients with microsatellite instability have a lot of um, what's called neoantigens that look foreign to the uh, patient's immune system. So those patients do much better on checkpoint blockade blockade inhibitors that ones that, that don't have this uh, genetic mutation. So we need additional therapies, we need new therapies. So an, a different approach to um, uh, harnessing the patient's immune system to kill cancers is called CAR T cell therapy. So in this case, um, what this involves is um, taking the patient's own um, immune system, taking T cells from the patient's peripheral blood and then genetically modifying those T cells to give them a receptor that will have that x-ray vision or have that ability to kill a cancer cell. So this would then be um, ex vivo or genetic modification of the patient's T cells, which are then grown up. So there are very large numbers uh, grown up outside of the body and then infused back into the patient. And this uh, therapy um, has been remarkably uh, successful for blood cancers, so for leukemias and lymphomas, where the cancer cells are actually circulating in the bloodstream. So you're generating killer T cells in a tissue, in a tissue culture um, well outside of the patient's body in, and injecting them back into the bloodstream. And it's very easy for the killer T cells to find the cancer cells because they're in the same compartment of the body. 
So as I said, they're very successful for targeting uh, blood cancers. And in fact, um, the FDA and um, uh, NICE in the UK have approved these therapies uh, for uh, adult lymphatic leukemia and for diffuse uh, uh, large B cell leukemia. And in uh, the NHS Wales, uh, in Cardiff, uh, these therapies are del being delivered to patients under the NHS. Um, but these, these don't work so well against solid cancers. And with solid cancers, they're not in the bloodstream. So the T cells that are being injected have to home, have to detect where the cancer is and be able to home to that, get to that site in order to kill the cells. And that's what we've been working on in uh, Cardiff. So I so said, CAR T cells injected in the bloodstream need to home to cancers to kill cancer T cells. Um, but the CAR T cells for, for blood cancers are injected in the bloodstream, they don't need to home anywhere, they're in the, the same compartment as, as the cancer. So this is where um, we were looking, not in cancer at all, but we were looking at T cell homing, actually in virus infection. So we were looking at influenza infection. And this is the, 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 the problem in, in, a, in a nutshell. So essentially viruses like flu, we know that infects uh, the lungs, but killer T cells that will then be able to kill virus infected or influenza infected um, cells in the lungs, because this virus is the parasite, it has to infect our own cells in order to, 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 to grow. Um, those killer T cells are not generated in the lungs. They're actually generated in one of the many, many, many lymph nodes in our body that drain the lungs. OK, so so the, the killer T cells, the CD, CTLs would be made inside this lymph node and then they would be released into the bloodstream and they need now to home circulate in the bloodstream and go back to the lungs in order to kill virus. So how do they do that? And that's what we were looking at uh, in Cardiff uh, a few years ago. And so our question was, how do bloodborne killer T cells or CTLs home to, to influenza infected lungs? So, and there was dogma. There was a lot of dogma in the literature and, and essentially um, we looked at this dogma. Um, uh, it's always good to challenge dogma. So we know that uh, the precursor of a killer T cell is called a, a, basically a naive uh, CD8 T cell. And we know it has a particular homing molecule on its surface called L-selectin. I'm not gonna say any more than that. And this, this uh, molecule is very important for getting those um, uh, lymphocytes into lymph nodes to then become activated into killer T cells. But the killer T cells, the cytotoxic T cells have downregulated this molecule L-selectin. So it can't be involved in, um, in homing to virus infected tissue because the, T, the, the killer T cells are supposedly no longer L-selectin positive. So that was the dogma. So um, basically uh, what we looked at that in detail and um, over overturned the dogma. So the dogma was that CTLs don't, uh, don't express L-selectin, but what we found is it depends when and where you look in the body. So we looked um, at actually in the lymph node itself. So this is 100% uh, L-selectin positive cells and very early after virus infection, the expression goes down as, as is in, in the literature and the dogma. But what we found was that it's actually re-expressed before the T cells are released into the bloodstream. And as they circulate in the bloodstream, they're all L-selectin positive. And in fact, what we found, um, actually to our surprise, but we did this, I made, this is my PhD student, Rebar Mohammed. I said, no one's gonna believe this because this is overturning Dhamma. You're gonna to have to do this in three completely different ways to, to persuade anyone out there that, that this is uh, um, uh, how it works. So he did that. And uh, this molecule was really important for getting these killer T cells to the lungs. So essentially in a nutshell, if your T cells don't have any of this molecule at all, you can generate killer T cells, but they won't home to the lungs. And so you have a very heavy virus load. 
obviously we, viruses can kill you and influenza can kill as well as uh, SARS-CoV-2. If you have a normal level of L-selectin as we would have on our, our T cells, then um, it's uh, down-regulated and re-expressed and that has a, that's pretty good at clearing virus. And then what we um, discovered was a genetic modification trick to, to maintain high levels of this molecule to stop it being down-regulated. And what we found was that those T cells were much better at homing to the lungs and much better at clearing virus. So we'd actually discovered a way of boosting T cell immunity by simply manipulating the expression of one homing molecule on a T cell. So then we, um, and this was our manipulation, maintaining L-selectin on T cells, and we call it L-delta P-selectin, boosts virus immunity. So the obvious next thing is, does this actually have any impact on CAR T cell therapy? This is our application of our, our, our fundamental uh, findings in the lab. So um, I hope none of you are squeamish, but we use mouse models. We can't do these experiments or these studies in, uh, in uh, people. Um, and we wouldn't want to, uh, to start off with. So we use a mouse model so we can grow a tumour in a mouse um, and uh, we can grow it in the lungs or we can grow it uh, subcutaneously in the, uh, the lower flank, uh, left flank of the mouse. Um, and we, the tumour is labelled with a, fluores uh, a luminescent dye so we can do non-invasive imaging in order to measure the tumour growth. So we grow the tumours and then we um, knock out the mouse's own immune system um, because we know the immune system is very, very immunosuppressive for cancers. So what we've done is, is knocked down the uh, mouse's own immune system and then we give it a bolus of these CAR T cells. So we're sort of overcoming the endogenous immunosuppression that the cancer is, is inducing. And then we monitor tumour growth out to humane endpoints. And I'm sure many of you will know that all of this work is done under home tight uh, home office regulations uh, in, in the UK for animal experimentation. Um, so I'm afraid this might be too much data, um, but I, what I wanted to point out is that the, what we did find was that our L-selectin enhanced T cells uh, in red here, you can see this is looking at uh, the survival of mice uh, with different cancers growing. You can see that mice getting these enhanced uh, L-selectin T cells actually survive, whereas um, mice that don't get any T cell transfers untreated or get T cells with a, a, um, a normal level of L-selectin, we do lose some of those mice. So, so this uh, manipulation is beneficial. And then we look at um, the growth of the tumours. We can see again in red that the tumours are growing more slowly than in the other uh, treatments. And these are the individual uh, growth curves. And this also works in a, 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 when a, the equivalent of metastasis model in the lungs. So here, what we've done, uh, I think you, this is a melanoma. So the tumor itself or the cancer cells are black because of the melanin. So I think the pictures here tell, tell the story. So, and these are sections again through the lungs at the end of the, 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 the treatment. So these mice have, uh, have, have the tumors in the lungs. They then have given no T cells at all. So you can see the tumor nodules in black all over the lungs. Um, these uh, mice have received uh, normal T cells. You can see, still see the nodules. These have received T cells that don't have any of this uh, l selects molecule at all. You can see these nodules. And these are mice that have received these uh, enhanced l selectin T cells. And we can't detect any nodules at all. And you can see by the reduction in, um, in lung weight. Um, so this really was, was quite exciting to us and, and suggested that perhaps what we discovered in the laboratory, starting off asking a question about how T cells move around the body in virus infection, has allowed us to apply this finding uh, to uh, cancer immunotherapy and suggest that perhaps this manipulation may be of, of benefit in, uh, in cancer immunotherapy. So obviously what we want to do, can you, oh, that's not sure why that's come down. What we would like to do now um, is we ask, we now want to translate, you now want to ask, well, this is all uh, in the laboratory and experimental situations. Is this going to be a benefit for cl clinical uh, 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 therapies? So this obviously um, uh, you will be familiar with as a translational uh, research from bed, from bench to bedside. How do we do this? 
So this is not so straightforward. It's not so easy. Um, uh, we're trained as academic researchers in the laboratory. We're not trained in um, how to develop drugs, but we, we basically wanted to start because it was our, uh, our discovery, but we, we were aware that any um, uh, applications we make may well have to go through an iterative process whereby we test whether they work in human T cells, because we've everything we've done so far is in mice, and then we might discover something in human T cells that will take us back to the laboratory, and we have to um, work out what's going on to be able to to go back to uh, human T cells. So we understand this is is an iterative process. It involves um, uh, protecting uh, your discoveries, so a patent patent uh, and potentially um, cost an awful lot of money. <laughs> um, I will say no more than that. But what we have done, we've made a start. So we started off simply by securing some transnational kickstart funding actually from Cardiff University, from the Wellcome Trust, um, which is uh, one of the largest medical um, uh, charity funders uh, in the world, probably, um, to test whether uh, just we can engineer human T cells with our um, enhanced L selection. That's the, the first thing we wanted to do. And that gives us a confidence in concept that, the, that, that this manipulation will work. Um, and we've actually done that very pleasingly. That's something we've managed to do in the last year. But we really need a collaborator um, in the commercial sector. Um, and that uh, is, again, not so easy, but I would say that lockdown has been a benefit to us because um, uh, I've been involved in a number of conferences online, which have been mixed audiences between basic researchers and uh, companies, a lot of biotech companies, and found myself on platforms um, with biotech companies and have been able to secure um, a, a working collaboration with one. Um, it's early days yet, we haven't signed the uh, or, or the paperwork yet. Um, but this is something that we found in, in, in lockdown. And I have to say, we have to look back and, and ask about the impact of the last two years, not only on our own research, but research in, in general. And obviously we've seen with the development of vaccines, what can be done when the will is there and the money is there. Um, and uh, so I, I feel very fortunate, not only for um, uh, that we can test our, our finding uh, to see if it has clinical um, uh, relevance, um, but also put it in the context and to remind you that cancer immunotherapy is not new. It's, it's been around for a long time. If we look at this advert here from the New York Times in uh, 1906, um, then uh, Dr. Coley um, uh, claimed to have found a cocktail of bacteria that could be used to cure bladder cancer. Um, and this, obviously there was no proper testing uh, done, but this received a lot, a lot of um, uh, attention, let's say at the time. And now we actually understand what are the toxins in the, back, in the bacteria that are actually killing cancer cells. So this is now being uh, revisited as, as cancer immunotherapy. And then immunotherapy has really undergone a renaissance. And one of the renaissances I told you about was discovering these checkpoint blockade inhibitors, and that comes sort of about here. Um, but I think then this ability to manipulate the patient's own uh, T cells and use them to treat the, to treat the patient is also a major um, step forward. So you may have heard in the news about different cancer immunotherapies and I have to say that sometimes when I hear those reports, I sort of hold my breath slightly because I think it's still very, very early days and we have a long way to go. But I think this is a, certainly a, a growth area for the future. And I'm going to finish by thanking um, uh, the people in my uh, group who have working on this. I. I uh, uh, won't point out what they've done, but we work very much as a team. Um, uh, those water cooler moments that we've missed in the last two years have been absolutely critical, critical to get people together to bounce off ideas. Um, and uh, we're getting back together in the lab. So that, that's the exciting bit. 
and I'm thanking all my uh, funders for, for the work. And, and to really emphasize again, how important the fundamental basic research is in order to um, apply um, uh, uh, your, your research, you've got to have the, the, the breakthrough findings. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne, for a stunning tour of immunology. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions from the audience here? There's one in the front row here. Hello, my name is Brad Quick. I'm so Hello. <laughs> um, we've, we've read us and stuck some quite amazing cures of. Mm -hmm extensive melanoma mm. and lung cancer already with some of these therapies mm. but one of the one of the things that everybody asks about is the terrible side effects yes. that, that they cause um releasing the, the, the body's immune system allows it to attack its the body itself doesn't it yes so it can do can you can you talk about that a little bit yes yes i can so i what i didn't um uh, uh really point out that the the, the checkpoint blockades, so the, the pathways, the molecules that keep the T cells under control, or that the cancer cells keep the T cells under control and prevent them the killing, is the same molecules that prevent our own immune systems from attacking our own bodies. So they control autoimmunity. So as soon as you come in with these uh, drugs into cancer patients, then they can basically stimulate what looks like autoimmune attack of our own uh, uh, tissues. This will very much vary between patients. And I think that um, we need to basically now work a bit on perhaps what we heard from our first speaker about targeted delivery of therapies as opposed to systemic delivery of, of therapies. And people are working on um, uh, combined uh, drugs that would target a T cell inside a cancer, but wouldn't target a T cell anywhere else in the body by giving it two signals. So it's like an and signal, a sort of Boolean gating type thing where you get there, but you don't do this unless you're, there's a cancer cell around. So I think there's more sophistication um, to come with drug development. I totally agree with you that we've heard some miraculous um, uh, well, cases of recovery, but there are some potentially downside effects. Um, but as I say, I, I sometimes when I do hear things in the news, I do slightly hold my breath and say, we're not there yet, but we've started the journey. Yeah, we started the journey. Hey, I have a, a question online here from David Wallace. Do individuals have the equivalent of a library of T cells with different functionalities? And if so, how far can we catalog an individual's library? Okay, that's a very, very good question. And in fact, um, I would say before um, 2020, we knew more about the T cells, their functionalities, cataloging them in mice than we did in humans. But what the, the pandemic has done is actually uh, mobilize immu clinical immunologists and laboratory immunologists to start doing the same for the human immune system. And it's a, it's a combination of the will to do it. We have to understand why elderly people and people of ethnic um, uh, uh, my, minority communities were succumbing to SARS-CoV-2 more than, more than youngsters. So we had to learn that. And that's going to be a combination of our environment and exposure to, to the virus and also the way our immune systems respond. So, and also the technology, so the omics, the ability to be able to do RNA sequencing of single cells. So then instead of getting a global picture of what's going on, you can get um, uh, the, the transcriptome from individual cells. So that is coming online now. And, and in fact, we've learned about five genes that predispose to SARS-CoV-2 infection and lack of recovery. So we're making very rapid progress, but I would have to say it's slightly sad that this has been precipitated by a, a worldwide pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's money, it's all money in investment and wanting to know the answer, yeah. 
So uh, related to that, uh, uh, from a Dr. Carol Cotter. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> um, Carol. <laughs> has the speed of development of the COVID vaccine meant that public expectations for cancer treatment developments are now unrealistic? It's a very good question, Carol. Um, there are two things. I think one is the doubt is the fact that um, uh, patients have stayed, you know, not been going to their GP or being referred to hospital for cancer. That's that's one side. That's that's not your question. I think um, the expectations are going to be high because we have been successful. We've been so successful with vaccines. And this is about commitment and investment. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's simply that. And so we've just responded as part of the British Society for Immunology to the, the uh, government's 10-year cancer plan. And it's a case of not only scientists and clinicians, but patients also advocating for this, this as well, and patients carers. Um, so I hope the answer to that is, 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 is not yes, Carol. I'm, uh, I think we just have to keep flying the flags and keep knocking on whichever doors you can, yeah, to say this is the future. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Ann. Um, so when upregulating up this L selecting, mm -hmm. do you see more uh, infiltration of uh, T cells into the microenvironment or more uh, cytotoxic effects upregulating up, up of the, uh, the existing T cells, which I believe which is PD-1 kind of a yeah. scheme is? So. That, yeah, no, that's yes. a very good question. In fact, we do see more cytotoxic T cells in the, in the cancer microenvironment when we give this therapy. We're now trying to ask whether they're all the injected T cells or whether they, what the T cells we've injected are actually now working as a sort of vaccine and activating the endogenous immune system. So are some of those T cells that are coming in, are they partly the T cells we've injected, or are they actually the hosts, you know, the endogenous immune system? So that we don't have an answer to yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that great talk. I, I love the slide about Renaissance, given uh, the, the, the history of the field. When you think about cardiology and oncology, very evidence-based, scientifically, biologically driven fields. When you think about psychiatry, I think right now a lot of academics and um, uh, are starting to try to be biologically driven. Mm -hmm. So in that slide where you mentioned pathways to inflammation, mm -hmm. um, depression today, there's very strong evidence that there's inflammatory responses going on. So presumably, a philosophical question first, why do you think evolutionarily there would be an inflammatory response when you become depressed or is it a chicken and egg situation? And second, maybe 20, 30 years down the line or maybe sooner, can many of the approaches oncologists are thinking about, can psychiatrists start thinking on that level of precision? Well, I think if you, it's about cause, it's about underlying mechanisms. If you can um, identify if there's a genetic predisposition or um, that's identifiable, then you've got the potential to target it, you know, treat it in some way. Um, I mean, I would say I, I'm, it's not my field, but I'm aware of what's going on in Cardiff with the brain imaging unit that, and with the G, genome-wide association studies that, that, that major inroads have been make, made into psychiatric diseases and understanding causes basically um, and then developing therapies based on that you know molecular mechanism we have to understand i think understand well that would be my approach understand mechanisms so yeah yeah um, we have uh, another question online from a uh, anonymous um, how does up regulating of selectin work i guess how, how is it actually mm. done and is there anything else that might be altered that might work better very good question. So we, what we've done is we have in in the in, 
normal situation, the way L-selectin is downregulated from the T cell surface after the T cells have become activated is it uh, undergoes what's called ectodomain shedding. So there's an enzyme that clips the outside of the molecule and releases it into the bloodstream and then it's de degraded. And then there's also a mechanism of transcriptional silencing. So where it's switched off basically at the genetic level. And so the gene is no longer, the, the, the messenger RNA is no longer transcribed and translated. So what we've done is we've um, mutated the cleavage site in the ectodomain. So it resists this cleavage. So it cannot be, uh, it cannot be downregulated by cutting it. Um, and we've used uh, a different promoter to maintain its uh, expression. So it's no longer is susceptible to the mechanisms that would silence the gene. So that's how we've done it. In Are these done by CRISPR techniques? We do CRISPR is very good for knocking out things. Yeah. It's not so good yet for doing point mutations. So we've done it by a process, an old fashioned process of transgenesis. So whereby you, you engineer the cDNA in, in, in vitro and then you use it to transduce, to transfect the cells, it is to change them, yeah, exogenously. And that's how CAR T cell therapy is done. It's the patient's T cells taken from the blood and then given, uh, it's usually a, a virus a lentivirus, oh. which delivers the genetic material. It's the way um, uh, some stem cell therapies are being done now, yeah. CRISPR's, I say CRISPR is very good for, for knockouts. It's not quite there for doing point mutations, very subtle mutations in proteins. And I was going to ask this anyway, how long does that process take? Days, hours. Oh, so so the for the genetic modification for T cells, then um, basically what happens commercially, so it happens in the patients, you know, in the NHS, the leuco, the basically blood is collected, the white blood cells are separated from the red cells in the plasma, and they're sent off to um, a company like Genentech who does the engineering, and three weeks later they come back in a big bag you know, and then are infused back in the patient. Like, a, I mean, it's a bone marrow transplant, it's equivalent to a bone marrow transplant. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, brilliant talk and, uh, and all sounds very exciting. One of the things that I noticed during the pandemic is, um, uh, massive vaccine hesitancy mm. and um and skepticism and what i noticed as a secondary school science teacher is that the conversations i was having with adults made no biological sense whatsoever mm. and i'm wondering whether you think that we have a serious problem here that needs to be addressed what strikes me is that far too small a percentage of the population have a basic knowledge of genetics mm. or protein synthesis or what a T cell mm. is or what an antibody is. Mm. No, it's, it's a very, um, a very uh, poignant question, <laughs> considering the situation it leaves individuals in and communities in, that's for sure. Um, I think in general, I mean, as I think in my introduction, I said, you know, this might be a revision. Uh, the first part of my talk might be a revision. You may have all heard of antibodies, you may have heard of antigens, but you know, do people actually know what that really means? They'll talk about T cells and B cells, but are they just using the words and not really understanding? And I think that's actually the case. Um, I do think though with vaccines, what we've forgotten and what individuals who are hesitant have they been vaccinated multiple times as a, as a baby and a child, you know, and it, but it was their parents who were deciding whether they were vaccinated or not. And we've forgotten what it's like to live with debilitating, life-threatening diseases. So, you know, my dad had polio in the 1957. It left him disabled for the whole of his life. In 1959, there was a polio vaccine for, for polio. So we've just forgotten, you know, we've had this quite protected life for a long time, clear of, in, of infectious diseases. Um, so I think, I'm not sure we're ever actually going to be able, I don't think pe people need to, 
be able to understand the nitty gritty of protein synthesis and that T cells have X-ray vision. I think one can have a very intelligent conversation about vaccines with them and, and, and explaining how they work in a, a non site in an accessible way. And we've done, I know the, the not to sort of advertise it, but the British Society of Immunology has done a lot of this during the last um, uh, two years. And we've had vaccine champions, which are the youngsters in the lab who go to schools, go to and, and, and speak with different communities and um, talk on a one-to-one -one basis and talk about vaccine hesitancy. And I think it, it takes time. You know, and it takes commitment um, to, to do it. And I think we, you know, we have to keep reminding people. I mean, measles, you know, measles can kill. Measles can leave you deaf, blind, you know, severely uh, uh, brain defects. But we've forgotten because we all have, you know, MMR vaccines. Um, so I think it's that... Um, reminder that these infections are dangerous. Thank you, Anne. There's one more question up in the corner. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, this, may, this may be related to the first question, but I was trying to understand why L-selectin is down-regulated mm. in the first instance. Mm. Are you able to, to talk to that? And that's a very good question. So we, this is why we started looking at this molecule because it's a very important molecule for homing of, for T cell homing, and because it's so important, we we wanted to ask the fundamental question: Why is it downregulated, and why are these two different mechanisms? So our approach as scientists was to generate gain of function versions of it to prevent it being downregulated and ask what what impact it has. So we found these these um, uh, made these discoveries about boosting virus immunity, boosting uh, cancer immunity by uh, by improving T cell homing. But we have, obviously we're looking out for downsides. You know, we don't want a therapy that's gonna be worse than the patient's own, own T cells. And I have to say, we haven't yet discovered it. <laughs> so, you know, we've had genetically modified mice admittedly kept under controlled uh, housing conditions, but they don't spontaneously go down with autoimmunity. So it's not like we've pushed the immune system so far that they, um, it's no longer, you know, it, we, we've lost control of the immune system. So I think it is a time target for immune evasion, actually. Um, so we know that cancers will actually downregulate L-selectin. We know that viruses will downregulate down L-selectin independently of what's happening in the immune system itself. So, um, so you know, as I say, we're not, our fundamental question was to understand why this molecule is regulated in, in this way. Um, and the fact that, as I, I think I said, as part of our overturning dogma was that it, the dogma was it just is switched off, it's just gone away. Well, we found it can be re-expressed. And we're actually now looking at the um, single cell RNA sequencing of these prime T cells. And we find that the gene itself does not immediately undergo um, transcriptional silencing. So it's not switched off. So we think that's because it's poised to be transcribed again and translated into more protein. Um, so that's, um, I think, something that's, you know, a, a different way of looking at it. So, so perhaps the switching off is just a transient thing. And it depends, I will go back to our original thing, it depends when and where you look. If you only look at a single time point in one compartment, like the blood, or if you're in a mouse, you know, a mouse, you look in a, a one tissue, then you may well miss something. And so it's all about timing and location. Thank you. Excellent. Are there any more questions? No more online? Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to our two speakers, Anna thank you. and Anne, for very stimulating and interesting talks. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in uh, two weeks' time on June the 13th, is that right? Uh, for Robin Catchfall's talk 
are, are we alone? Um, safe journey home, everyone. Or maybe see you in the bar. I don't know. Um, and please thank our speakers in the usual way. Thank you.